We only have a few weeks left in this year's annual theme of Authentic Community. And the whole hope, my whole intent, uh, our whole intent in teaching through this year is that we would come to an understanding of what it really means to live in authentic community as a church. And it's challenging. It's really, really hard. And um, today I want to talk about uh, the spirit and community or the power of the spirit in community and the need for it. And I'm going to start I just kind of planned on doing this right when I walked up. Uh, I'm going to end with this idea of we have to be open to the Spirit. But I'm going to start with that. How about that? I'm going to start with this idea of um, for any of this to happen, anything I'm going to talk about this morning, we have to be open to the Spirit. And so if you could, if you would uh, close your eyes, just bow your heads. We're going to pray right now. And the way that we're going to pray is we're going to pray in openness. like, and maybe we just open ourselves up to the, to the Spirit and be willing. Um, so let's just be silent for just a, a few moments. Take a, uh, a breath. The Spirit um, of God is called the ruach or the, the breath in Hebrew, the, the, the wind or breath. And uh, when God created humanity, he breathed into them the breath of life. That's the same exact word, ruach. He breathed the Spirit into them. And so there is this huge connection of becoming um, present through breathing. There's something very Christian, biblical about this idea, ancient even, in that God breathes in us. So let's take a few breaths right now. God, have mercy on us, Lord. We need your spirit, God. We're open to your spirits leading and prompting and moving this morning. We're open into into ways that you might um, move us into uh, reconciliation where that might be hard or forgiveness where that might be hard or love and even liking someone when that's hard um, in community. A forgiving an offense of uh, bearing someone else's burden and thus fulfilling the law of Christ. Those are all really hard things to do in our, in our flesh or in our, like our own humanity. Very difficult. And that's why we need your spirit, God. If we're gonna be your church in San Francisco, we need your spirit. So we just open ourselves up to this. We wanna breathe in the breath of life now. We breathe in the invitation of your spirit to come upon us, to be Uh, We want to be aware of your spirits working and how your spirit would want to work in our lives individually right now and then us corporately as a church. Um, We love you, Lord. We really do. We love that you are among us. We love that when we gather that you're here. We love that you're moving people to follow you, that you're challenging uh, kind of the status quo of what it even means to be a Christian. I thank you. We love the city. And even though it's so hard, it pushes us into choosing um, whether we're going to kind of live under the pattern of the world or really live under the pattern of the gospel. And I thank you for a city like this um, where it's so sometimes difficult to follow you in. And Lord, we pray that you would teach us. You would teach us now. I submit all my capacities to you, God, and we pray together in the strong name of Christ. Amen. Amen. If you are new to this community, uh, we want to welcome you. Uh, This past year, we have endeavored to talk about what it means and what it looks like to live in authentic community, authentic Christian community. And as a part of that, we have had some difficult conversations and some difficult teachings around topics that seem to divide the church today and even divide our society today. So this community has experienced a lot of passion this year and also a lot of pain this year. People have stayed and committed to difficult conversations but find themselves very tired right now. So maybe the people in and around you that have been a part of this year that you probably find, you probably bump into a lot of tired people, a lot of emotionally tired people. They've had really hard conversations with their community, uh, with their friends, with their family uh, over the last year and it's been exhausting. You might even bump into people who've uh, opted out. They, They come to Sundays but they don't come to community group anymore. Or you might you might not bump into them because they've completely left altogether. And some of the most challenging things we've talked about is how to live in emotionally healthy relationships. We've talked about race. We've talked about sexuality. We've talked about singleness. And we've talked about marriage. 
Oh, and we have a, a politics lecture coming up in a few weeks as well. So there's that. Um, should be fun. Should be fun. I say all that because we have to be talking about this stuff as a church. Um, I think a lot of us desire not the happy, clappy, churchy stuff, like where we just talk about things that um, we all can pseudo agreed with. We have to talk about hard things that not many people, uh, not many people agree with outside the church or inside the church. So I think this is really important stuff that we model what it looks like to disagree in community, what it mo what models what it looks like to have sacrificial love towards one another in community. Um, and I say all this because I want to catch everyone up what's going on in the room in real time right now. And the question I want to ask is how do we have the energy to keep going forward? Unless you're an Enneagram 8, which is like this need to be against, how do you keep going and contend? Any Enneagram 8s in here? <laughs> Some of you guys like Enneagram 8s, like it's my favorite year ever. Like I love it. Just so much conversation. Uh, unless you're, but, but unless you're that, how do you keep going? How do you keep going if you just like don't want to argue anymore? If you don't want to, if you don't want to disagree anymore? When you, don't, when you don't see eye to eye with your community, when you're coming from completely different life scripts and you're just exhausted of having these conversations. I think of how Ash and I have been fighting a lot recently about, uh, about our, in and around Juniper's bedtime and her schedule. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Um, ha, like I, I think I said this a, a few weeks ago, like having kids feels like a whole other reason just to fight. Um, we, Ash and I see the world completely differently. Let alone I'm a morning person, she's a night person. The, and there are times when we're fighting about how we're going to raise Juniper when I in my, like seriously, like feel this thing where I'm like, I don't know if we can raise a child together. Like I don't say that, but I feel that. <laughs> like I feel that, like that's real, which is insane. That's crazy, of course. But in the moment, that's exactly how it feels in the moment. And we're fighting about bedtimes. Not anything real yet. Like not anything real at all, okay? But what happens when you're talking about real stuff? Like race and sexuality. How do you keep going in community? How do you get, keep going? Because this community is a covenant community, if you didn't know that. Like marriage, we talked about this in friendship. Melissa did an amazing job explaining how friendships are covenant communities where you're covenanting with each other. The same exact language used in friendships Jesus uses in marriage or the Apostle Paul uses in marriage. And so how do we commit to each other in a covenant community? And the answer is this, only by the power of the Spirit. Amen. Only by the power of the Spirit. I read this quote this last week. I thought um, I would share it with you just to kind of raise the, the level here. It says this, bring it on, Holy Spirit. Shake us up, send us forth, kick us out, and make us more interesting church than we would be if you had left us alone. That is such a good quote. I understand. It's a daring quote. It's a dangerous quote. It's basically the quote we prayed at the beginning of this year, and he's done all of this stuff. We want to be a more interesting church because the Spirit has messed us up and messed up our paradigms and messed up the things that we need the Spirit to do this. See, we are told that the goal of the Christian life is to be conformed to the image of Jesus, or to use regular language, to become like Jesus, right? That's the, the goal. This is Romans 8, 29, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Like, the goal of the Christian life is to become like Christ, and of course, the question is, how does that happen? Now, there are all kinds of subpoints we've taught extensively on this. There are all kinds of subpoints to becoming like Christ. But the main point, the main answer to which everything else is a subpoint is it happens by the power of the Spirit. Paul says this in Galatians, Galatians 3.3. After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? This is New Living Translation, by the way. Kind of makes it a little bit more blunt. How, why, are you, why in the world, a life that began in the spirit, are you trying to not complete in the flesh or complete with your human effort? What Paul is saying is that the whole of the Christian life and its community began with the spirit. The spirit enables you to declare that Jesus is Lord. The spirit poured out God's love into your hearts and allowed you to say, Abba, Father. And the whole of the Christian life and its community must be, must remain in the power of the Spirit. We need the power of the Spirit. And what I think this means for us is that we cannot be an authentic community diving into difficult stuff without the Spirit's empowering, without His power. It's the Spirit that brings breakthrough. Only the Holy Spirit can soften our hearts. 
Only the Holy Spirit can open our minds. Only the Holy Spirit can inspire our consciousness to a different, like a whole new reality. Without the Spirit, we are working in the flesh or we are working in our own human effort. And when we do that, we are almost always doomed. We need the power of the Spirit. Bring it on, Holy Spirit. Shake us up. Send us forth. Kick us out. Make us an interesting church. So what does that mean and how do we live in the power of the Spirit as a community? So three things that I want to talk about today. The Holy Spirit creates community, empowers community, and heals community. Creates, empowers, and heals. Uh, let's look at each one of them. First, creates. The Spirit of God creates community, not us. The Spirit builds community, and we participate in the building process. But it's His work. The Spirit builds the church, and it's not our work. We cannot manufacture it. We can't pick and choose it any more than we can pick and choose our own birth parents. Which means anyone who was baptized into our church, and there was a, 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 a several of them baptized in our church a couple weeks ago, when they are baptized into our church, they are brought into this family or into this community by the work of the Spirit. The Spirit does that. All those people who stood up here and said that we are following Jesus and we're brought into this family, all, all those people that were baptized, the Spirit, the Spirit did that. Not, not any one of us did that. The Spirit did that. We didn't pick and choose those people out of like random crowds all over the city. The Spirit of God did that. And the same way, we don't choose who comes in this community. We can't choose the people we want to from the streets. We can't look at someone from the streets and go, oh my gosh, or maybe our workplace is like our favorite people at work, or maybe our favorite quote unquote influencers on social media or whatever. You can't go pick those people and go, I want you to be baptized into my community. You can't do that. I mean, you can try to, I, I think you should try, by the way, to do that. Um, but you can't do that. That's not your power. Only the Spirit does that. And so anytime someone's brought into this community, it wasn't us that did it. It was the Spirit that did it. And so what we do is we welcome them in. We go, you are brought in, but not by us, not by our power, but by the Spirit. So we don't choose who comes in. So I have, you ha I have your Bibles. You should have your Bibles in Acts chapter 2. Let's just read this really short uh, passage here through verse 4. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they, meaning the, the believers, the, the, the disciples of Jesus, were all together in one place. Suddenly the sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on all of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So this here is the formation of the new Jesus community by the Spirit. This is what every scholar, every theologian says is the beginning of the church or the birth of the church happens by the power of the Spirit. And the Spirit does all of this. We know this because all of these allusions are back to the Exodus. You guys remember we studied Exodus a couple years ago back when God created and formed, I think it was last year actually, back back. <laughs> When God created and formed Israel from a mixed multitude of enslaved people into the people of Yahweh, okay? That's what the Exodus is. Now, if you remember, in Exodus, there was fire and there was violent wind. There was fire. When the Israelites left Egypt, they were led by a pillar of fire, which was a sign of God's special presence and his power leading them into freedom and his being with them. Now in the book of Acts, there's a fire presence again, but this time it separates and rests on every single one of them individually, meaning the Spirit is making a new Exodus people who will be led by him. Then in Exodus, we have this mysterious violent wind which dried up the waters of the Red Sea at this very crucial moment in their journey, allowing the new people of God to walk to safety on the other side of the Red Sea, if you remember that story. Now in Acts, the same mysterious violent wind blows through, coming from heaven and fills the room and themselves. It's the Spirit. This, this is what the Spirit's doing right now. The Spirit is delivering and making a new people at the same time. He's delivering them out of, out of this, a sinful generation or out of sin into this new people. Ebernard Arnold, what's an amazing name, um, said this in his book, uh, Why We Live in Community. Um, it's an amazing small little book that I read this last week. 
says, the church we believe in lives in the Holy Spirit. The spirit we believe in bears the church within itself. The church of the spirit will give life to the future unity of mankind. It gives life already now to all truly living communities. The foundation and basic element of every community is not merely the combination of its members, but simply and solely the unity of the Holy Spirit. For the true church is present there. The Holy Spirit births the the new community of God, which means that the basis of community, the basis of Christian community is not social ability, but faith. The basis of this church is not the fact that you can be social or not, but it's if you can believe or not, which I think is a really important point. Meaning community in the church is not so much about trying to be social with people and get along with people, but about faith. So when you're sitting across from someone that you don't get along with, when you're you're sitting across someone that you don't agree with, the main thing isn't to be social. The main thing isn't to go, let's have fun together or let's try to do something where we like each other. The main thing is, do you believe in the Spirit's power to bring unity? Believing that Christ is building his church through the power of the Spirit. So our posture towards one another is one of belief and hope in the Spirit's power to make us one. It's sitting across from one another and saying in your heart, I believe that Jesus is building his church. I believe that the Spirit is answering Jesus' prayer among us to make us one as he and the Father are one. I believe that the Spirit is adding to our number daily those who are being saved. And when they are saved, we bring them in and welcome them into our family because we don't choose our family here. The Father chooses the family through the work of Christ by the power of the Spirit. And so faith is a, a, such an important element in our church, in our community, that we believe that, that the Spirit can make us one. That we, can, we believe that Jesus, by his Spirit, can allow us to see past our differences and make us one. Next, so first, the Spirit births the church or creates community. Second, the, church, uh, the Spirit empowers community. And this is the long point here, so just sit, sit with me. This, I think this is really important. One of the things we have to acknowledge when we are talking about authentic community is the thing that is going on inside us almost all the time is the reality that we are and we are not communal people at the same time. We are communal And we are not communal. Every single one of us is a mixture of both. No matter who you are, introvert or extrovert, we are all communal and not communal at the same time. We are all sociable and not sociable. Ashley, my wife, is an introvert and I am an extrovert, which means I love people and she doesn't like people, right? That's (laughs) basically what we think it means, right? But that's not really true at all. Some would say, I'm sociable as an extrovert and she's not so much so, which is not her at all. But uh, so, for example, we'll be in line at a, a store, like Whole Foods or whatever, wherever we, shop, wherever we shop. And we're sitting there and the people in front of us will be talking about anything, like anything random. Like a stranger talks about like how the, her favorite cheese is discontinued by Whole Foods and whatever. And Ash will just enter into their conversation. She's like, oh, I've had that cheese too. You try this other cheese because this other cheese is the same one, but it's made from the same different cows or they aged it, whatever. <laughs> oh, really? I should go try that. I can go get you one real quick because I'm, I'm next in line. You, you're already there. So I'm going to go get you one real quick. I want you to try it. And I'm sitting there going, what are you doing? <laughs> this is totally weird. You're not, they didn't talk. They're not talking to you. <laughs> they were never talking to you. They were talking amongst themselves and they were probably not even wanting you to listen to what they were talking about. She's like, no, no, they needed my help. I'm like, I don't think they needed your help. This is the kind of, like, so she is so sociable, which I would never, ever, ever think about talking to strangers like that, ever, at all. To someone I know, absolutely. I already, I, I, I have to talk to too many people as it is. I don't want to talk to new people, right? <laughs> but she's so sociable when it comes to that. Like she was saying yesterday, we were talking about this. She was like, I can bear my soul to a stranger and the people that I know, I don't want, really want to talk to them. Like that's kind of how she feels all the time. Like this, like, but so this is the point. All of us are a mixture of being sociable and not sociable. And we carry that in ourselves. All of us carry this. And we take it for granted and we believe that the church is just made up of a bunch of sociable people. 
And that might be true, but we are also weak and we are also selfish. Most of us struggle between trust and mistrust, where we all believe and we don't believe at the same time. In other words, we are full of ambivalence. And thus, in reality, community is much more complicated than we think. Oftentimes, we repress our feelings in community because our real feelings can cause us anxiety. If people only knew how I really felt, would they allow me the patience to let me air out what I feel to get to the core of what I'm saying, or will they judge me really quickly right away and push me away? Will they, will they allow me the patience for me to say something that might sound really horrible, but then they, answer, they ask questions so I can get to the core of what I'm feeling? Or will they write me off right away as soon as I say what I'm feeling? Or what if you hate fighting and you know that if you told people how you felt, it would start an argument, so you never tell people how you feel because you don't want to get into an argument? See, a lot of us repress our feelings in community because feeling our feels causes us anxiety. Now, instead of all of this toxicity, what we need, and this is not simplistic at all, what we need is to trust in the Spirit's power that is already at work in us. Because what God demands of us, we cannot do in our own strength and ingenuity. We need the Spirit's empowering. We need to trust the Spirit to be at work. What if through our own ambivalence and through our own being sociable and antisociable, full of all of these different things, what if that's the Spirit working out in us to bring continuity? But what we're doing is we're just kind of holding that all in and we're just carrying it ourselves and thinking that we just need to take a, a pill for that or a break for that or whatever. But what the Spirit's really trying to do in community is work that out in community. But we all have to show up for that. We all have to show up for that and trust that. So what's the Spirit's role in empowering our church? What is he doing? What is the Spirit doing? Last week, I shared three main metaphors that are used of the church in the New Testament. They are the kingdom family metaphor, the temple metaphor, and the body. This is what I walked through this last week. And these images, what I shared was how Jesus was the authority in every single one of these metaphors. In the kingdom family metaphor, he's the king. In the temple building metaphor, he's the chief cornerstone. And the body metaphor, he's the head. And we're the body. In the same way, Paul gives, oh, the New Testament, I should say, gives the, the spirit a role in all of these metaphors as well. So let's look first at the kingdom family metaphor. The kingdom family metaphor, the, the spirit, and we already talked about this in the first point, the spirit is responsible for bringing members into the kingdom family. So that's, a, that's the spirit's role. Romans 8 says that we are, that the spirit is called the spirit of adoption, which can only mean the spirit is the one responsible for our adoption into God's kingdom family. So in this kingdom family metaphor, what the, 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 what the Spirit's role is, is to bring people into the family of God. It's to continue to bring people in and pull people in. Now for the temple building metaphor, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Turn over to your right. If you're in Acts, um, it's to your right. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, um, verse 10. Let's read this. Uh, let's read down to verse 15. Again, we're talking about the building metaphor of the church. The church is a, a, a temple, a building, right? So it says in verse 10, By the grace God has given me, I, Paul, is writing this, laid the foundation as a wise builder, and someone is building on it. Each one should, uh, each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So Paul says, I'm building this church, this temple, and the foundation is Christ, right? He already says this, uses this metaphor before. I laid a foundation, that foundation is Jesus. This church is built on Christ. Now, all, all these other people, I came in as an apostle, and I built the church, I was a founder, and then I left, and then all these other people are building on it. Every single person in the church is building the church. And everyone should be careful how they're building in this church. 
If anyone, verse 12, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown but for what it is, because the day, capital D, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but will be saved even only even though only as one escaping through the flame. Stop there. Now, this is all metaphorical language. It might get confusing. He's talking about the church a little bit here, but um, what he's saying is this. Jesus Christ is the foundation of every church. And everyone in the community, everyone in the church are co-builders with God. The question is, what are we building with? Are we building with materials that will last Gold lasts, precious stones last, silver lasts, wood does not last, hay, straw does not last. If the fire of God's purity or presence comes in, all of that stuff built of wood, hay, and stubble are going to be burned up, but the stuff built with good materials are going to last. Are you with me? You guys get the metaphor? Okay. So the question is, what are you building with? And what if... This wasn't about, what if this, this passage wasn't about you individually? What if it wasn't necessarily about how we take it? Like, how am I building my life? What am I building my life on? How, what am I building my life with? Am I building with good things or bad things? What if this wasn't as individual as it is corporate? What if this wasn't just about you and your immediate family? What if this was about the church, not the church, but this church? What if this passage was about this church? And one day you will stand before God, like I will as a pastor, but all of us will stand before God. And what we build into Christ's church will go through a, a purifying fire. And what we built into Christ's church will remain the good stuff. What if this here wasn't about your individual life, but about this church? What if the Spirit was asking us, you're co-building this church, Reality San Francisco, it's not just the pastor or the staff doing it. It's you. What are you building with? How are you building into this, the life of this church? How are you building with precious materials into your community? How are you building? Well, the next obvious question is, what are we building? Okay, we're building a church. Okay, but what is this for? Look at verse 16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives among you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person for God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. A couple things here. This is a, a verse that people use for suicide. It's not about suicide. It was like, well, if you commit suicide, you're going to hell. That's not what this verse is about at all. Um, this verse is about destroying God's church. If you tear apart God's church, God will tell you, tear you apart. That's what it's saying. If you have any part in trying to demolish and tear apart God's church, God has words for you. God will destroy you. I don't know what that, I don't know what that means. I don't, I don't even know, want to know. I don't want to get into what that means. I'll just say this. It's not good. It's not a good thing. This is how deeply God cares about his church. First of all, he wants you to build into it with things that last I always think it's funny that people give the church typically their leftovers. Like, I have this old couch that no one wants full of fleas. Does the church want it? Like, no. <laughs> we don't want your ugly, stanky couch, okay? <laughs> this is kind of what happens, right? Like, oh, I'll give the church, like, leftover stuff. We're all supposed to give the church. And I, by the church, I don't mean me or the staff. or the, the, I'm, I'm talking about to, to give this church your best, Think of people that are serving in our kids' ministry, and I'm over there, and I'm getting my notes ready, and I'm across the hall from them, and I hear kids just, you know, they get dropped off. They just, they can't, some of them lose it. You know, you know, they, they just, and you hear, um, I think Seth is leading worship over there today, and he's just singing Jesus Loves Me over these kids just kind of wailing. And I think of, like, that, that's costly material. Like it's building our church with beautiful material. I think of the kids that, people that serve in our kids ministry and what they give up of themselves on a Sunday to, to, to serve in that way. Like building with costly material. I think the most costly material that you have in your life is your time. That's some of, some of us can write a check fairly easily. If you can, 
you should still do that. Um, but your time, your time is really hard. That's a valuable thing. Uh, we know it more than any, anyone. Uh, I mean, we know it in the city more, more than most people that time is money. And so our time is valuable. And so this is what we're really building here. Oh, sorry, I lost my point. My point is this. What we're building is the presence, a place where the presence of God lives. That's what Paul say, says we're building right there. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit lives among you? What are we building? We're building God's temple. For what reason? So God can live among us. See, there are all kinds of temples in this city. Equinox is a temple. It is. And it has its own va- a, a vision of a good life. Uh, Facebook campus is a temple. Salesforce Tower is a temple. They all have their ideas of what the good life is. What Paul is saying is that the church is the temple. And what's different about this temple than every other temple? That God lives here. That God lives here. That's what's different. And we should all be experiencing life in this church. All of us should be experiencing life. The last metaphor is the body. What's the spirit's role as someone who's in the body or the, the metaphor of, as the body. Turn over to the right again, Ephesians chapter four. Verse one. What's the spirit's role in the body or the metaphor of the body? And the answer is unity. The spirit's role in the body is unity. Look at verse one. Um, As a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all and through all and in all. You were baptized into the reality that is the spirit. Therefore, you are now a Christian inside the church. And as we're a church, one of the metaphors of the church is that we're a body. The spirit's role in the body is to keep us one. To make us one. Which is why, if you skip over to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25, all the sins listed in verse 25 through 31 are sins of discord. Are sins of disunity. Look, actually turn there. Look at verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. That's, that's because that's for the sake of unity, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So when we're talking to each other in, in the spirits community, he wants unity by making sure that when we're using our words, we're using our words well. Verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. How are, you, how are you going to grieve the Holy Spirit of God? By talking in unwholesome ways toward one another and God's church. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. See, we pull this verse, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, out of context. The context is unity. The context is how we use our words with one another. The context is how we treat each other. And the way that we grieve the Holy Spirit is by treating each other bad, slandering one another with our words, destroying one another with our words. By bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander, all of those things grieve the Spirit of God. So what the Holy Spirit's role in is in the church, the empowerment that the Spirit brings is one of unity. But not just unity, the Spirit also empowers us for diversity. It's the Spirit's role to make sure that we are a body, that we are a body that is not just one giant foot. I mean, it's silly, right? But it's it's true. Like, God is not glorified if this if if the reality is just a foot. It's like you guys are just a foot, and God's the head and he has a foot, and you're the foot. Like that's not, that's not, and and the spirit's role in the church is to make sure that doesn't happen. You get what I'm saying? The metaphor is to make sure that we have every single part and they're all working together so that we make sure that reality has a hand and an arm and a leg and a foot and an eye and a nose and all these other parts that are covered up by our clothes. That's basically what Paul's analogy is. 
And it's the Spirit's job to make sure that we have diversity. The Spirit is, is responsible for making sure that we are not all white or not all black or not all brown. For making sure that we're not all Democrat or all Republican. For making sure that we are not all Kanye fans or whatever. Like he's making sure that all of that is happening in the room at all the, t- all the time. That not just one person is this. And that's what, oh, that church is made up of all of this. The Spirit's like, no, that won't do. You're a body. That's not going to work. Well, this, this church is made up of all of that. Well, that, that's not going to do either because you're a body. And my job, the Spirit says, is for diversity. So guess what? You got to leave and you got to leave and you got to come and you got to come here. I, I really feel that the Spirit's doing that. I really feel like the Spirit in our church, if we're giving over control to this church, and this is hard for me, to the Spirit, he's going to make our church look a lot differently than if I had ideated ideated it myself, or I had visioned it myself, or anyone else had. The Spirit does that. And it's only the Spirit that can hold this tension. Lastly, the Spirit heals. A modern metaphor might be that the church is a hospital or rehab center. So if we, if we pulled a modern metaphor, he's a body, it's the body, it's the temple, right? It's the family. A modern metaphor might be, oh, it's a hospital. The, the church is a rehab center. I mean, it's much more than that, but it, it is that. In the fellowship of the Spirit, there are people who are in different and various stages of healing and sobriety and growth towards holiness. Can we just not forget this? Amen. Some here that might be here this morning that's sitting right next to you, that you just met during the meet and greet time, some here are just being wheeled into the emergency room fresh from the biggest wreck they've ever had in their lives. And they're here today because... This wreck, this accident, this thing that happened that they could have participated in or not participated in, or it could have been their fault or not their fault, whatever happened, they're here now in this hospital in the ER. There are others who are just out of, out of some major surgery. There are others who are in intensive care. There are others that are in need of physical therapy because the worst is, is over, but now they have to learn this to live in this new normal. And so in this whole rehab, physical therapy sort of thing, the wreck happened three years ago. I'm living, I'm learning how to live my life now. Now this is the new normal. And others here are full of health and they're going about their ordinary lives like no one else is sick. And this is the church. The church is full of just a bunch of different people in different places. And whatever stage we find ourselves in, This community of the Spirit is a place that you should be able to heal, where you can heal, because you cannot heal alone. You cannot know what it means to be a follower of Jesus alone. You cannot know what it means to be a human alone. Desmond Tutu uh, has said this. He said, a person is a person through other persons. None of us comes into the world fully formed. We would not know how to walk or think or speak or behave uh, as human beings unless we learned it from other human beings. We need other human beings in order to be human. I am because other people are. This is uh, ultimately uh, what it means to be rehabilitated in the family of God. We need each other. And the last thing I want to say is where we began, we have to be open to all of this. We have to be open to the spirit at work in this church to create a community that God wants in San Francisco and open to his empowerment and open to his healing. We have to be willing and open for this kind of community. And I think at this point, we have some agency here. We have a part to play. There is a human variable to life in authentic community when it comes to the spirit. And it's this, are you open to the spirit's work in community? And that's the question that I want to end with. Are you open? This is hard. I think the fear here is, I think the fear is this when you talk about this Holy Spirit in any sort of setting, is the loss of control. That's the fear. When we're talking about the Spirit, the Spirit that gives life, the Spirit that animates, the Spirit that leads, the Spirit that convicts, the Spirit that heals, we are afraid of giving over the control to the Spirit of God. I mean, a little insider, real talk. Every pastor of any church is trying to impose their will on the church. 
Every single pastor, whether they're, whether they, they, they say they're not doing it or not, every single pastor is doing this. And the great tension for all of us, myself included, is letting the Spirit have His way. Because there are some things that we bring our own ingenuity to, our own creativity to, our own sort of plans to, and we have to submit those plans to God. I have to do that over and over again as the pastor of this church. I believe that you have to do it over and over again as a member of this church. And that's the fear. Will you lose, will you give up control of what you think this church should look like? Or what I think this church should look like and strive for unity? And strive for oneness and strive for diversity? And strive for the Spirit's empowering? Basil Pennington says, the spirit enters into a community when through its members' common yearning, the community opens itself up and makes itself ready to be spirit-driven. Through the members' common yearning. A yearning for the spirit to, to take over our church. A yearning for our spirit to make us one. A yearning for our spirit to make us diverse. A yearning for our spirit, uh, the spirit to, to allow us to bring our precious stuff to the church, our time and our resources to the church and say, this is, this is for the church. This is for Jesus' church in San Francisco. I'm going to bring my best forward. I want to build with good materials by the power of the spirit. Because what we are building is better than anything else that's being built in Silicon Valley. Anything else. Anything else. Because in this thing, the Spirit of God lives. God himself lives in the center of us. And so, as we close, would you stand and we're going to read this quote out loud together as a church. Bring it on, Holy Spirit. Shake us up. Send us forth. Kick us out. And make us more interesting church than we would be if you had left us alone. Let's just sit for a second in that, in stillness. Would you open your hands up to God in a posture of openness to the Spirit? God, I think of Romans uh, chapter 1 where you say that, um, like, the end result of our sin is that you leave us alone. I mean, I think that's what hell is. You just let people alone. And we all can be in our own ways in our personal hell where we kind of feel um, maybe even in our own sort of sin, you've left us in our sin. Because we've said, we've given you the middle finger. We've said, we've written you off. We say we don't want any, you don't want, we don't want you to be in any part of this. And Lord, that is the worst thing that can ever happen. And we just say, don't leave us alone. Don't leave our church alone. Make us a more interesting, strange community than we would be if we all got our wills to make sure that everyone agreed with everyone else and it was all perfect. That is not your church. Make us more diverse, God. Make us more empowered, God. Make us more connected and one, God. I pray there would truly be no need among us. There would be needs that happen, financial needs and so forth, and our church collectively would feel the weight of it not individually, but collectively, where we are all here to help. Make us one, God. We thank you. We love you. We, um, we thank you for what your spirit is doing. And I'm even now just sensing that there are a lot of things that we have written God off on, even individually. And we need to bring that to God today, even right now, and saying, don't leave us alone, God. This teaching was recorded live at Reality San Francisco. And as a part of our weekly gatherings, we move from teaching to responding to the Holy Spirit through prayer and a time of ministry. It's hard to capture that on a podcast, but we encourage you to pause and consider how the Holy Spirit might be inviting you to respond to what you've just heard. For more resources and details of how to join us on Sundays, please visit realitysf.com. May the peace of Christ be with you.